Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let's start. Um, I am a, a very warm welcome to this session on sustainable finance here today. I am very happy to be here and to be doing something that I love doing most as a journalist, which is asking questions about strategies to tackle climate change. Um, because, as you all know, like if we don't find a solution to this issue, all other problems that we are discussing um, will become very irrelevant soon. And um, this obviously requires a huge shift in, our, in the way our economy works, including the financial sector, which has a very big role, of course. And the multi-million dollar question that we will be talking about today is what this will exactly mean and how to get there quickly enough. So I would like to, um, to introduce you to our speakers. Um, Andrei Vetonslej, um, he's, the, he's the Minister of Finance of the Republic of Slovenia, who is also Chairman of the European Investment Bank's Board of Governors, and as I also could see, has a very impressive record in academia on finance. Peter Kazimir, Governor of, um, of the National Bank of Slovakia, and member of the Governing Council of the ECB. Um, he also rec um, represents Slovakia at the European Systemic Risk Board, is governor at the IMF, and is alternate governor at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Yeah. Good to have you. Pierre Heilbronn, he is the Vice President for Policy and Partnership at the European Bank for Re Reconstruction and Development. He has a lot of experience also working for the European Commission, as well as in French politics. Um, and last but not least, Timothy Murphy from MasterCard, General Counsel, and before that he was Chief Product Officer, responsible for the development of payment solutions to create a sustainable advantage for MasterCard and its clients. Um, as a first question, I would like to address Mr. Heilbronn, um, the European Bank for Reconstruction and, uh, and Development has many years of, of experience in the field of sustainable finance. Could you share a bit um, with us which lessons you've learned over the years and what do you think that you should do to avoid that the new Green Deal becomes um, just a bunch of, la of empty words? Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting, obviously, us uh, to share at least our experience, which is, as you, you reminded us, not completely new. Um, EBRD has been created nearly 30 years ago. Um, with the idea of supporting not only transition to market economy, but transition to sustainable market e economy. And uh, in the charter, uh, by the way, creating the EBRD, uh, the idea of sustainable uh, financing uh, and, and, and climate financing is really at the heart of what uh, we were supposed to, to do. This is understandable because probably we were covering one of the region uh, which is the less inefficient in terms of, of, uh, of uh, carbon intensity. Uh, and that explains also not because of we are more gifted than others, but we were confronted to this uh, reality that uh, the bank developed from very early on, for example, uh, instruments in tackling uh, energy uh, efficiency through financial products, which developed as early as uh, 1994. This has continued over the years also through new targets, new ambitions. Uh, we have quite an ambitious goal of, uh, which was set uh, in uh, the, the COP21, which is to finance uh, next year 40% of our uh, investment, annual investment in, in this area, climate change, mitigation, adaptation, and we are uh, already at that, this target. So uh, we have this experience, 30 billion of investment in, in that field, uh, more than 1,600 projects in that field, and, and uh, working not only on policy, and I will mention probably we'll go back to that, but also with a very strong local presence, local banks trying to support the local banking sector, uh, delivering products specifically tailored uh, to the challenge of uh, sustainable finance and, and climate change. 
what are the lessons we can draw uh, from this experience of, of 30 years? I think, first, that um, there is one part of the solutions which are linked to regulation, legislative frame, framework, regulatory framework, and we really believe that only investing is not enough, if, or, or trying to invest is not enough, if you don't tackle the, the root causes, uh, more or less, or obstacles, bottlenecks, which are linked to the local legislation. So it, it, it leads sometimes to forbid, to ban certain things. We'll have this discussion uh, probably later on, uh, on waste, on, uh, in certain sectors which are producing a lot of emissions, like the uh, steel sector or auto uh, automobile sector. But I think the second lesson is that you have to, to bring the private sector in finding ways to deal with a distribution uh, issue. If you, you want to transition to carbon neutral economies, you need to tackle more or less the question of job creation and how the losses and gains are uh, distributed among regions, among actors, and that leads probably to be very active with the private sector, having a holistic uh, strategy based on the different geography, which takes cohesion at its heart. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Um, as a next question, I'm coming to Mr. Bertensley. Um, before starting, before commenting on more the general topics that we are going to discuss, I wanted to start on the very current um, news on the on the next Tuesday, the, the European Investment Bank, which you are the chairman of the Board of Governors of, um, will decide whether to adopt or not the very ambitious draft that they have presented in July which includes phasing out fossil fuels by 2020, but it seems like there's a lot of opposition against that starting now, or manifesting during the last um, weeks. Um, can you fill us in what is going to happen on Tuesday? What is at stake here concerning the future of fossil fuels, especially with regards to natural gas? Thank you. Thank you. Well, a lot of money is at stake here. <laughs> um, it is uh, predicted that one trillion euros in the next 10 years will be needed to tackle uh, climate-related uh, challenges. Uh, needless to say that projects within the European Union are competing for the various sources that are available within the European Union. Uh, so when I discuss and when we discuss climate-related ch uh, challenges, uh, no doubt Europe is leading the way and it should stay that way. So we need to tackle that, that issue for sure. But there are some other issues that uh, need to be aligned with, with this and how to align the policies within the Euro European Union and how to finance all these issues. Let me relate uh, this issue to these more regional issues that we all uh, are aware of. Uh, Central European countries, including Slovenia, where I'm coming from, are below EU average of uh, being uh, in terms of development. Slovenia currently at 90%, along with the Czech Republic, some other countries between 70 and uh, 90%. So we need, in addition to that, substantial cohesion funds. And recently we have developed uh, additional instruments within the European Union, like big budgetary instrument for convergence and competitiveness. So different funds will be available, so we need to, to align first in terms of terminology and then how to allocate these funds to, to topple all these issues. For us, of course, climate and convergence and competitiveness is of the utmost importance. So we need to address all these issues. Uh, European Investment Bank, of course, is the, one of the largest uh, providers of investment funds uh, uh, to climate-related uh, uh, investments, and it's going to stay that way. So the, the strategy is that up to 50% of funds will go into that direction, additional 30% to uh, uh, cohesion, so development uh, uh, issues. So in this respect, uh, let me uh, raise another issue that uh, we uh, face as uh, finance ministers. Uh, out of all countries, two 
in that part of the region uh, are part of the Eurozone, and this is Slovakia and Slovenia. The rest are not in the Eurozone. So out of 27, not counting the UK, 19 countries have adopted Euro as a, as a common currency. Uh, so this is one, one, one issue that, that we face. And of course, countries with Euro face different, let's say, challenges and benefits, of course, than countries that are outside of the, of the Eurozone, as we discussed. And within the Eurozone, of course, we have the one monetary policy. And we discussed previously uh, in depth the monetary easing. Next to that, <coughs> what we have, and this is a unique situation, when, when I compare the European Union to other two major trading blocks, China and the US, is that we have 27 different fiscal policies. <coughs> Even within the Eurozone, we have 90 different fiscal policies and we have relatively strict fiscal rules. And the issue that was raised in the previous uh, discussion is, is very relevant. What can countries or finance ministers do in terms of fiscal easing in order to stimulate uh, the growth? Addressing another issue, which I believe is a sort of a strategic gap. Europe is growing at much lower growth rates than compared to China and the US. And we, even within the European Union, we have uh, very different growth rates. Uh, we discussed it slightly that uh, Germany is somewhere close to, to, to recession. Some would say that it is even approaching the, the recession. On the other hand, we have the Eurozone that, that average growth is around 1.5%. And we have countries, especially in this region, where the, the growth in average is around 3%. So there is a, is a huge difference. And, how to keep it that way. This is my most important issue for me. How to stimulate this if we know that the, the external uh, surrounding is, is, let's call, cooling down. So it is domestic demand. So in order to, to spur domestic demand, we would need investments. And of course, investments like, as you mentioned, climate investments, I think uh, even more important is how much additional money investments we will put into science and infrastructure in, in Europe in order to, to catch up, not just regionally, but also globally to, to catch up and, and stay on that level as we are and, and to keep that high standard of living that we have right now. Uh, Europe is definitely one of the most innovative areas uh, uh, in the world. Uh, but what we lack and what we are trying to do is uh, capital market union. We don't have efficient European capital market union to finance this. We are very output inventive, but invention needs to be translated into product or services and then it becomes innovation, you know. We need to capitalize on this. So this is going to be another issue that, that we need to, to address in Europe. So one not to be too long, one is how we will address our fiscal policy or fiscal policies within the European Union, especially within the Eurozone. And what we will do, and we are currently doing a lot, towards uh, uh, capital market union in order, and this is the final goal, to not just stay, but even to become more innovative and more competitive in global terms. Mm -hmm. But in, like, to put it in more concrete terms, what would that mean? What would these challenges mean for sustainable finance? Which role could, for example, um, is it coming to you, Mr. Kashmir, um, to which which role could central banks play in this in this challenge of of moving more towards sustainable finance, of moving our economy towards a more low carbon economy? Once you are asking me. So it's, you decided to, to start from the heavens because you want, you know, <laughs> uh, just uh, what, sustain, what, what does it mean sustainable financing and, and, and this word, what does it mean to be sustainable in this uh, today's world where um, the part of our day-to-day -day business is uncertainty and, you know, the economics likes certainty, also the family life uh, likes certainty, but unfortunately, um, what we are surrounding with uh, with events which are materialized in, in risk. 
And uh, yes, uh, the, um, the climate change has become um, the, the part of financial risk and can be materialized in the threat to the financial stability. And that's a, that's a, a reason why we have to focus also on, on, on that issues. Uh, you know, um, the role of, of central banks in, in, in this matter can be just really the pioneering, you know, and just to 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 revoke, to irritate, to catalyst uh, role in in a discussion um, and with policymakers. And I think we try to do our best in, in in this area. I just would like to to draw attention to the um, establishing of uh, NGFS. This is a so-called coalition of, of willing. Uh, exactly, this is network for greening uh, the financial system where the central bankers are um, uh, get, gathering together with the supervisors and relevant, re relevant uh, key players on the financial markets. And, and this is a very good forum, you know, just to, to put together and, and to start from the very, very fundamental um, basis on, on, uh, on, for example, very simple issue like, like to collect data because we don't have proper data. It's just just very simple question about what does it mean? What is the eligible, uh, eligible the green uh, investment? What is it? You know, it's extremely for for our, for Slovaks and uh, for what Andre said. For example, is it uh, the nuclear uh, energy? Eligible as a, as a green uh, investment? Yes or not? Yeah, and I know that this is a very delicate issue uh, in several countries, uh, but looking at the energy mix in, in countries like Slovenia, Slovakia, uh, Czech Republic, are uh, this is um, the part of, of normal life, you know. So uh, from from this point of view, uh, uh, back to the central banks, uh, what we we are lagging, of course, uh, behind the trends. Uh, we have to focus on, on, on the intellectual capacity. I mean, we have to really hire the more experts in this area, uh, together with uh, the new technologies, uh, the, the green financing. I think this is part which we have to uh, tackle daily. And uh, just to be very honest, uh, on investment, because you know central banks also used to uh, invest uh, uh, we are behind, and it's, it's why it's, it's quite clear, because um, we are tight on security and liquidity. And um, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, the credit rating of, of green investments is uh, so high at the moment. So most of investment opportunities are below investment eligibility level nowadays. Um, also, central banks invest in high liquidity papers, and I, I'm afraid that this is not the case of, of, of green, invest, green investment again. And again, about the maturities, um, this approach also disqualifies the green financing bonds. So, uh, we are working in, in this coalition of, of, uh, of, of willing, uh, where Slovakia would like to be the part of, of this coalition also in three work streams. You know? So the first is, uh, is banking supervision, the second one is macro prudential policy and also supervision, and, and the third one is very interesting, this is about the scaling of investments. And uh, together with, with markets, uh, together with, uh, uh, with uh, international or multinational international institutions like EBRD or EIBR, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, we have to share the experience because this is really very new. We, we, we can just talk hours about that. You know, you know that it's uh, the global uh, question. You can read many tweets against, uh, uh, but uh, uh, what's the reality is uh, that, for example, I watched uh, yesterday the Armageddon movie, if you remember. <laughs> so, so just, and this is not fun, just to want to, to see it that. Uh, once we have a kids, and it's, this is about the day future, and uh, this is our responsibility. So sooner is better also from the point of view of, of central bankers. Mm -hmm. Just to quickly follow up on the, on the um, hint that you gave on, on what big data could play in this, until the EU ex taxonomy, for example, is adopted, that might take some time. Could big data um, anal analytical tools be... Um, a solution until until um, 
a European um, classification system is adopted? Definitely, yes. Uh, the, the question is, who is the owner of this big data? And who is uh, willing to, to share this data with us? And of course, about the analytical capacity just to handle with this, with this and to, to squeeze <coughs> the data in a proper way. Uh, but we are, we're just working on that, you know. So, on, but on the European level, I think, you know, just to, to be dependent on, on national initiative, I think it's, 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 it's not enough. And so, so international cooperation, I think it's this fundamental uh, requirement. And how so far are we with this? <laughs> how far? Uh, I just told you that we are lagging, you know. So um, uh, we, we just can start to with, uh, for example, with companies, with, with private companies, w private uh, um, uh, experts which are coming from, from co private companies which, which can just to offer us this big data and, and analytical capacities. So uh, this taxonomy uh, is, this is the part which uh, uh, it's on one side it's, it's inevitable that we have to go further, on the other side we have to decide if we do it uh, on our in, with our internal capacities or we are just um, outsourcing is also uh, possible in this area. Mm -hmm. Coming more to the consumer side of things, um, Mr. Matthew, would you share a bit your experiences with at Mastercard working with the consumer side of sustainable finance? Where are the challenges in this? Where are the the, the gains that can be made here? Yes, with pleasure. So, um, you know, our conversation so far has been um, macroeconomic policy, um, uh, major economy incentives, and national um, investment programs. Uh, I think we also have to recognize the financial services industry touches uh, every consumer uh, with a bank account, uh, which is substantially every consumer in uh, every citizen in Europe and uh, in other parts of the world. And I think there's an extraordinary untapped opportunity for us to use that scale and reach uh, to encourage more sustainable economies. We're already educating consumers about the power of and the importance of smart investing, of savings, and this can be another topic, another area, I think, that our industry can, can cover. Um, and we think that's critical. So um, at MasterCard, we have looked at the importance of sustainability. We believe fundamentally in taking a long-term view and the need to invest in the societies that we operate in. Uh, we've been fundamentally committed to financial inclusion. Sustainability needs to be a part of it. And when we look at what we're doing, we realize, look, there's a lot that we can do in our own shop. We were the first payments company to adopt science-based targets. We have 100% renewable energy. Uh, we will look at green bonds, so we will look at, we issue debt in the euro markets, and we will look, on, look at taking on financial covenant obligations to meet our own um, targets, uh, which I think is a very interesting innovation that you're seeing, obviously, come around to the marketplace. But really, none of that is all that interesting because we're relatively small. We're 17,000 people around the world. Um, but where we can have an impact is the network that we operate and how we can reach consumers. Um, and so there's a couple of things that we're thinking about in that space. Uh, first, um, although plastic cards will eventually go away, they're not going away for a while. Um, so what can we do uh, with partners in our supply chain to have that recycled and have that uh, better environmental uh, impact? So that's one thing. Secondly, um, there's a lot we can do to help uh, incentivize consumers to use the parts of the economy that are relatively um, environmentally and sustainability, sustainable friendly. Um, and so anything we can do to make it easier for people to move to uh, mass transportation by electronic payment solutions is good for sustainability uh, in the economy. We're working in the developed, developing world um, on pay-as-you-go solutions for um, uh, solar energy um, because so much of um, uh, the develop, developing world, um, people are stuck you know, with small coal, fires, and so on, significant contributor to uh, environmental issues. If we can move people onto solar with a pay-as-you-go, easy-to-pay model, leveraging electronic payments, now that's <coughs> also interesting. Um, but I think the real opportunity sits uh, here in Europe and in the United States and in other places where how can we help consumers make wiser spending decisions? 
uh, we've partnered with a, an extraordinary company in Sweden called uh, Deconomy to create an app that, uh, using an index that we have created, helps consumers understand the carbon footprint of their spending decisions, and then gives them the information they need to make better spending decisions. If we got that out at scale across the network, if that was adopted more widely within our industry, um, I think empowering consumers to make better decisions has to be a key part of this. That's the only place uh, that uh, that scaled change can happen, and then what can we do even beyond information and empowerment to incent consumers to do the right thing? Financial, the financial services industry does a lot of marketing and loyalty programs uh, every year. What can we do to make um, overall sustainability part of those conversations? So these are things we're looking at. We're looking at them, frankly, from a competitive standpoint. We think they can be real differentiators for those segments of the population, and they're growing, particularly as millennials and centennials uh, grow in, in terms of their uh, spending power. We think these are uh, very important things to do, and they can make a meaningful contribution as part of a wider set of investments that a country might make in uh, sustainability. You know, at the end of the day, from where I sit in New York, Europe is the leading global regulator on a whole range of issues on the new digital economy that is forming, whether that's on privacy or open data sharing. Uh, and I think Europe can take the lead on these issues as well, um, because European leadership is absolutely required. Talking about the information that you provide clients with, what data do you base that on? What informations do you use to inf inform your clients on this? So we, we don't have, when the information that we see on our network is really <coughs> just the simple aspects of the payment card transaction. So it's the merchant, um, the date, the time, and the amount of money that was, that was spent. But really from that, we're, we're able to derive, using some advanced analytics, uh, an index that says, well, if this is a, uh, if this is a sp spend <coughs> on a mass transport solution, that's one sort of character of, um, of environmental impact. If it's an airline flight, that's another. <coughs> and through that, and th these are uh, open, transparent um, algorithms that we'd be prepared to share, we're giving I I consumers an indication, a relative indication of their, uh, of their environmental impact. No doubt this stuff can be improved over time, but we'd rather get it out and start working with it and, um, and see what consumers think about it. The trick is to empower consumers consumers to make better choices, uh, and that's really what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And you touched upon the differences between the debate in the US and Europe. What else is there talking about sustainable finance? Which differences do you see in the debate that you see in the US, and where is this Europe? Uh, well, in Europe there is a debate happening, uh, so that's sort of, that's kind of one answer. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, the politics on this issue in the US are, are sufficiently um, toxic that I think very little good, le very little progress, uh, very little, uh, very little <laughs> policy is happening. Um, so you have an opportunity to lead when, um, uh, while that debate, while that debate goes on there. We'll see. Mm -hmm. And coming to the challenges again that you were mentioning before, um, for especially the region where we are here at the moment, um, which challenges do you see talking about adopting measures concerned concerning sustainable finance here, which challenges did you mean concretely before? Uh, first, this is a very broad uh, topic, and we, we have to address it from different uh, perspectives. <clears throat> Our strategic platform in Europe is sustainable development, so everything is basically based on sustainability. Therefore, sustainable finances, or how to finance sustainable development, to put it in, in other words. So we are competing with two major blocks among, among others, and there are some, some differences. So the most important challenge for us in the future will be how to transform from, let's say, standard industry to, or to standard economy to circular economy. That includes all these topics like uh, climate change, digitalization, uh, uh, robotization, uh, and in other words, how to transform standard industry into industry four, as we used to say, and how to change our society into society five, to use these broad terms to, uh, to describe what I'm meaning in, in just uh, two words. And of course, the major challenge is going to be how to finance that. In Europe, uh, unlike the other two blocks, we have 
much of uh, public funding. We have uh, public schooling systems, we have public health care, we have public uh, schemes. So basically all of this, or majority of this, is financed through taxes and social contributions, unlike the other, the other two blocks. So I think this is European values and we would like to keep it that way. Let, let's start from this uh, platform. So in order to keep it and to stay competitive, we will have to transform to something that is called more added value industry. And these modern industries uh, will, will, will have to adapt and of course we will need to finance that. And in addition to, to public finances, and of course all finance ministers, we all know that we are rather short on, on, on uh, public funds. Uh, we would need to attract, uh, let me put that way, your money. So mm. we would need to increase private financing. So we will need to, to do more in terms of public-private partnerships. We would need to attract more public-private uh, uh, private funds. And what we talk about, and this is, will be the topic of, of tomorrow, about capital markets, it's, it's more going to be savings and sustainable investments. So this is going to be the major topic for us, how to, how to tackle this and how to develop these instruments. And they cannot be developed over the night. But we have to stay competitive now and tomorrow. So in my view, a lot more will have to be invested into, into science. First of all, basic research. Even large US corporations like Google, Microsoft, will not be there without substantial US government financing, and then, of course, private companies will build on these uh, findings. This is exactly the case in this, the United States, and this is what we need to do in Europe more, substantially more, if you want to stay competitive in the future, because I think this is going to be one of the most important battles that, that we need to, 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 to at least stay in, 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 in that confrontation, not to, not to win the war we would need to increase that. So again, additional funding will be needed. And of course, a di different instruments will have to be developed. I already mentioned that Europe is one of the most uh, uh, innovative uh, or inventive areas in, in the world. But in addition to inventive, you need substantial funds, you need capital markets, you need uh, uh, equity, equity market to be developed to a much larger extent and more sophisticated extent than we have right now. And this, of course, will attract a lot of money that we need to finance this. What I mentioned is really huge amount of money for small economies that we are mostly here gathered. Uh, this is really tremendous amount of money. Just for the climate, we said one, one trillion uh, euros. For other investments in, in in uh, science, for example, we say about 3% of GDP to catch up. And in addition, in this area, we need to address the issue of convergence, you know. How to get that developed that we will be at least on the EU level and then on. So substantial, really substantial amount of money will need to be gathered. And in this respect, of course, I see uh, some of the institutions uh, like uh, uh, banks, uh, investment banks or development banks to, to participate next to public financing or taxpayer financing, I think the major issue for us, because we are not that used to it as our Americans, uh, is how to attract uh, private, private funds. First, to develop the instruments. This is one thing. So savings, and the, but the other thing equally important is what products or what projects can we develop that will be profitable enough? Of course, private investors will invest if the projects are profitable enough. So a mixture of all this, I think, is something that will enable us to go toward a sustainable uh, path in the future and the way how to finance is, is the mix of this. That's what I call sustainable financing. Mm -hmm. In Slovenia, you have a company who is pioneering in, in electronic aviation, Pipistrel. So is, do you see um, maybe Slovenia, as, or which, which mechanism in Slovenia work towards attracting private money into 
into these kind of um, sustainable research projects? Well, uh, for your information, Slovenia is a small economy, but it's a very open economy. 85% uh, of GDP is, uh, is related to exports in Slovenia, so it's really a small, very export-oriented economy. And of course, we are even more, uh, let's say, influenced in good and in bad ways to what is developing in our surroundings. As previously discussed, Germany is as well for us the major trading, trading partners. And next to external developments, of course, internal developments are, are very important. So from my point of view, what is, was important for me is to first to establish macroeconomic stability and uh, uh, near term uh, as well uh, financial uh, stability in the state, including fiscal, fiscal prudence. So one of the ways in terms of Slovenia was to, to get to, to budgetary surplus and to lower public debt and to have this uh, uh, European uh, uh, financial structure in line with the Pact of Stability and Growth. So within two or three years, we will achieve this. I think this is very important also for foreign investors, that they see uh, macroeconomic and financial stability and already uh, financial investors and rating agency, for example, we have now double A standard uh, level are uh, seeing Slovenia as one of, uh, of the opportunities to, to invest. Of course, we are open to, to the investments, but on the other side, on our side, what we need to do is, uh, next to that uh, financial or monetary easing that the European Central Bank is doing, as we are part of the Eurozone, is what we can do on our side in terms of uh, fiscal easing and here I have, a, to be open, slightly different uh, view what we need to do in Europe. I think we need to <coughs> start discussion within the European Union how to do a bit more fiscal easing in this respect in order to, to finance what I see crucial for Slovenia to put more money in, in the future, and I would call it to put more money in, in science, and to put more money in infrastructure and especially infrastructure, let's say modern infrastructure, will help us to fight climate-related issues. Mm -hmm. We need to have a very good, let's say, sustainable transportation. We need to work towards smart cities. Uh, uh, and I, I see this should be the solution for, 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 for us um, to move toward uh, really becoming a carbon neutral country and to meet all these goals. We are currently meeting these goals, but to meet this very important goal by 2050. Mm -hmm. But to be very honest, to meet all these goals, Slovenia alone, we don't have sufficient financial funds. I currently really doubt that any country in Europe has sufficient financial funds to, 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 to push through all these projects that have been discussing today. Mm -hmm. So in this direction, Developing capital markets on the Europe-wide level is very important for us because we are a country of two million people to develop our own capital market. Of course, it's very important, but it's definitely not sufficient. We need to attract monies or go for the instruments Europe-wide. Mm -hmm. Um, analysts say that we have about th as little as three years until we need to phase out fossil fuels to stay below the 1.5 Celsius limit of global heating, otherwise consequences might um, get a very, um, really out of hand. Um, this means a very, very quick shift of finance into renewable energy. Um, Mr. Heilbronn, what do you think are the biggest obstacles um, for now that keep um, that keep this shift from happening. Um, and just seeing that the time is running out and I want to open the floor soon for questions. Um, as a second question that I wanted to ask you as well um, is if you could touch upon the climate resilience bonds that you introduced just a couple of weeks ago and maybe just comment on um, what the differences to green bonds, what, this ro what, what, what their role might be in the future. Thank you, and very quickly, because uh, I think we should have time also to have questions and answers. On the obstacles, um, I think uh, many of them have been already mentioned, and I think point to the fact that we should uh, 
uh, have both a top-down approach and a bottom-out, uh, bottom-up uh, approach. The top-down is very much about defining standards which are cross-cutting, which are reliable, applied by as many actors as possible, mm. um, and um, relying on a common infrastructure. And it's exactly what has been said about the common uh, the CMU and its next phase, which will be very important to have a, a real European market, capital market. We are doing that, by the way, we are trying to do that. For example, building a pan-Baltic capital market. And I think step by step, also having not only the infrastructure but the product will uh, uh, allow investors to be attracted in not investing in one single European country, but investing in Europe as a, a coherent uh, uh, environment uh, in, in terms of regulation. The second element is uh, beyond the price signals, which we didn't talk about, but obviously finding uh, the right carbon pricing is obviously a very important element, not only to, to scale up uh, climate financing, but to, to also shift uh, the investments from, uh, from brown to, to green, more or less investments. I think what is also important is tackling in, in an integrated way regulation and investment together. Um, green cities were mentioned, for example, we are developing really a, a consistent dialogue, both with the governments, but also with the private sector in countries where we operate, looking at how you can change transport policy, energy policy, all sectoral policies in a given town, while uh, putting together the investment. If you don't do the first thing, you will never get the traction for the private sector to invest in a real way in these markets. So that's, I think, the second element I would like to stress. Last, you mentioned uh, climate resilience uh, in bonds. Uh, we issued uh, the first one of them just before the, the UN Climate Summit uh, uh, two weeks ago um, for more than, uh, than $700 million. Uh, These are more or like less the first application of the resilience principles which were adopted uh, in September. Um, and it points to the fact that you have both to find a set of principles where uh, countries agree, and I think that's also the challenge inside the European Union about the, the taxonomy, because it's a fundamental element for investors to be sure that they are investing in something which is really mm. uh, aimed at what it is supposed to do. Um, and, uh, and I think that's a groundbreaking initiative, which points also to uh, further work between central banks, uh, uh, that was mentioned, but also uh, among regulators beyond central banks uh, uh, to provide this framework. Mm -hmm. Let's open the floor now for questions before we run out of time. I would collect three questions at a time. Please quickly state um, who you are and also to whom you are addressing your question to. Um, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I already presented myself in the previous panel. I'm Andrei Odulescu from Romania, Bank, and Bank of Transylvania. I, very interesting uh, discussions here, and thank you very much. My question is, regards the, uh, these topics are already old in Europe. I mean, it's a question of implementing the ideas, because everybody talked about capital markets since 2012, since Draghi said, uh, we should do everything to save the euro area, but nothing happened over the past seven years. Not even the banking unions was completed. Uh, people talked about the case of Slovakia. My question regards how can we improve, uh, how to say, the regional integration in order to generate regional champions here in terms of economic development, in terms of research. Because if we look at the eurozone from the structural point of view, we have a few hubs of how to say, very competitive on the global arena, uh, but uh, except, let's say, these hubs, the rest of Europe is uh, uh, dependent on um, outsourcing from these hubs, and we are living in a global world where nobody 
No, no economy can uh, intervene to save the global economy. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and, and okay, yeah, please. Okay, my name is Banerjee. I'm from the National Bank of Slovakia. And my boss is over there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here, uh, you know, it's, uh, three things strike me. Uh, one is, uh, it says, Europe leading the way. Uh, Mr. Kajime talked about we are lagging. But in a way, Europe is leading the way because of something which is happening in the Amazon forests. The externalities which are involved in climate change activities cannot be just, you know, uh, we talked about one country cannot do it, it has to be Euro-based. But now we are seeing that it has to be global-based. So if the global impact of what's happening in the Amazon rainforests and what's happening in uh, Indonesian forests, it would, initially they said, mind your own business, don't interfere in local affairs. Now they're saying, if you want the change, you have to contribute. So part of the financing has to be based on, uh, either in terms of budgetary financing, transfers, from the national level or from the regional level to another continent and another country. So what's the view of the panel on that? Uh, the second question I have is, uh, Mr. Kajimir quite rightly <coughs> identified few uh, items where central banks have to be more innovative. Uh, but there is one aspect, I think it came out in the papers yesterday, where the IMF has been asked to look into the relationship between monetary policy and climate change. Uh, now, this is something which, with the former uh, managing director of the IMF moving to the European Central Bank, maybe the ECB will uh, begin to pay attention to that. So that's... Uh, mm -hmm. Let's take one third question. Yes, please. Go, go ahead. Alex Martin is my name. I'm with Globsec. Uh, my question is for, for Mr. Murphy. Uh, we also discussed a bit earlier with the young professionals. And I would like to hear his views on how do we cope or how do we go hand in hand both with the proper regulatory framework and in the same time staying competitive given the global context. So how those two are seen in the US if Europe is leading the way when it comes to, to regulatory frameworks and how on the other hand we manage to lead the way when it comes to research, when it comes to investment. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Mr. Murphy, would you like to start? Yeah, let me, let me start with uh, some thoughts on that, um, uh, both because the other questions were much harder and not in my bailiwick, and because I'm afraid someone's going to ask me a Libra question, mm -hmm. so I want to take up a little bit of time. Um, <laughs> the, um, you have six minutes uh, left. We yeah. talk about that later. It, this is a sustainability panel. Um, <laughs> look, I think <laughs> the, um, and by the way, blockchain, not particularly sustainable at the moment, so just put that out there. Look, I think the, the point um, on um, our, our, our view is, is, is very clear. We need, uh, we need macroeconomic stability and we need certain regulatory frameworks that are, uh, afford a level playing field and are technology neutral. Um, the, the, the European approach to regulation is, um, generally speaking, more thoughtful, forward-looking, planning-oriented. The U.S. Nat naturally has a more uh, laissez-faire approach. It doesn't mean that regulation doesn't come, but it, it often comes following a market failure as opposed to shaping a market into the future. That would be my observation just as an informed citizen. Um, I think that in this space, um, because Europe, Europe's ideas about the future and how the digital economy in particular is evolving are resonating in markets around the world, other countries are adopting them. And I have never seen in my career as a, as a, in, in, in our industry something move as quickly around the world as the privacy regulation in Europe is happening right now. So, so my, my, the, the balance to be struck between an over he heavily handed regulation and something that's too light is one that each society will make. I do not suggest that one is better than the other. We simply need to recognize the difference. I think the point for Europe today is to say, increasingly Europe is regulating for Europe but with global impacts. And those, that thought should be in regulators' mind as they think about whether it's privacy or in the, in, in the uh, area of sustainability, the European agenda. And it just comes with global economic leadership, which clearly is, is uh, what is increasingly being asserted here. Okay. Looking at the time, maybe we can um, 
put the answers together with last thoughts. Okay, I will try. Uh, maybe we could be confused. So we are leading or we are, we are lagging in, in Europe? Um, I do agree that, yes, uh, the Europe uh, is leading the debate or discussion on, on these matters, but you know, we used to talk a lot in Europe, you know, so the, just to be sure about the reality, it can be a little bit different. Uh, what I said, we and central banks, we are lagging, I guess. And, and so, and uh, Mr. Banerjee, he was asking about that, you know, he's uh, commuting, commuting, commuting at, uh, regularly from New Delhi, so he knows what does it mean, pollution in the air. <laughs> and he's right that this is a global issue, you know, because, Andre, you, you are right, we can be proud mm. about a zero, um, uh, zero carbon economy, but once uh, uh, in India or in, or in Africa, we have countries uh, with very old-fashioned style economy or industry, that's the problem still is here. Yeah. You no, know, and what we have to we have to go against the temptation to, for example, to export the second second class technologies to the underdeveloped countries because then this is we are not this is really we are not going to tackle this issue. Uh, I know that uh, Andre mentioned the three million um, uh, euros, you know, three trillion uh, dollars in the world, in, in the air. You know, uh, I was a minister of, of finance for many years, so I know that uh, this is a headache of, of finance ministers in every country. Mm. And just to be very blunt, this is really mission impossible to finance, to go green, to maintain uh, the, the social standard, uh, to finish uh, infrastructure, um, the old-fashioned old fashion one, or virtual one, just to, to tackle the, the problem with the new technologies. This is, this is simply impossible, uh, and it's impossible just from the, from the point of view of, of public finances, you know. So leverage, it definitely is, is, is needed, you know, and, and we have to just to be very honest on, on, on that. You know, it's, then we have to go fiscal. Uh, I, I do understand, you know, this, maybe the Germans and Dutch are the only two nations in, in the world where the spending is painful. <laughs> so hopefully uh, this is a good opportunity uh, also for them to, to start and to focus their, their efforts on, on, on green financing, I mean public funds, and, and they, would like, they would like to do it. I, I'm a pretty sure that it's the right time. And back to the... Uh, Undeveloped countries. Maybe it's, it could be good, you know, just to like like we in Eastern Europe. You know, we we uh, we skip several technological levels. You know, for example, in in bank industry, like Romanian colleagues said, you know, the the level of of services is much higher than in all distinguished democracies. I'm so I'm sorry. Why? Because we just we jumped directly to the certain technological level. You also can. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. So maybe in, in the third countries could be, I think my recommendation is then go jump directly to, to, to the environment friendly uh, economy, mm. if it's possible, but they must do it with our help, mm. you know? Mm. So yes, Some this, is, the, this is definitely, this is the global issue and this is the issue which must be tackled on the level of G7, G20, UN, uh, with the uh, SDGs, and th this is really this is not just only blah blah blah. This is a uh, this is very serious uh, issues which um, must be tackled globally. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Mr. Vatice. Do you have something to add? Uh, yeah, well, we are now in the midst of budgetary discussions, uh, not only on national levels. Now it's the time to discuss budgets on national levels, but also within the EU. You know that we are now having deliberations about the new uh, period 21-27, and within that, uh, uh, different instruments, uh, EU budget, uh, so-called BIC, and so on. And what I see as an important here is that we will align uh, policies and our views how to tackle different, different issues, different projects within these uh, financing instruments. And at the same time that we will address, let's say, climate-related re challenges and uh, cohesion-related challenges with cohesion, and how we will find the right uh, taxonomy and how we will find the common language on these issues. Well, Europe is not co so uh, homogeneous as uh, uh, US and China, you know, one government, one monetary and one fiscal policy. 
we nevertheless have to deliberate and then, in the end, agree uh, in related to financing taxes, even uh, cons with consensus among uh, 19 uh, euro zone ministers. So sometimes it takes us days and nights, as my uh, colleague from Slovakia knows, to get to, to that uh, conclusion. I think this will be now in the near term very important. So discussions that we'll have from now on and in 20, that we will agree on the common language and common policies as we are policy setters for the budget 21-27, because with these instruments, and these are financing instruments, we will address the issues that we are discussing uh, today. Mm -hmm. and Mr. Heilbrunn, do you have some closing remarks? Very shortly. I, I think there, there are two kinds of issues which have to be tackled. First, the question of scale and pace, which is an issue for Europe, but it's a global issue, which has been very much highlighted before. It links also to leapfrogging in terms of technology innovation, but also scaling, uh, scaling up existing solutions, because we think uh, sometimes too systematically about radical innovation. There are also, uh, in many areas, and uh, when you think about energy efficiency, proven technologies, which afterwards you have to scale up. So that's, uh, I would say, sc scale and pace is very important. The second dimension, which is very important if all that is uh, made acceptable to citizens, is obviously that this transition should be equally, uh, at least the, 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 the transition should be just, if you want, which means that everybody uh, can find its interests taking into account different starting points, uh, given different development, gi given different histories. The, and that is obviously the case within the European Union. Uh, so all the reflection about should we create a fund and how it would uh, ease these uh, tensions which can be uh, uh, divisive in terms of regional integrity, which, uh, which was one of the questions, is also a question uh, which goes beyond the EU borders. Thanks. Obviously, we could continue this discussion for much longer, and I hope we will do over coffee. There is a coffee break now. Please approach us during coffee break and let's discuss further. Thanks. Thank you.